Well, hello and welcome everybody to another fun show from Bears Key Film. Listen, I I got a lot to say. I'm going to get the very little good, I guess, out first because there's always, you know, there's always both sides. I thought Caleb starting 7 for 7 was a positive. Although his first incompletion came on a third down. Still, seven for seven is better than what we saw in week one. Uh, those those jitters, I thought, kind of went away. Passes were a little bit more on target. Just to speak to that, even if he has a shaky game right now, he's probably still the best quarterback I've seen in 25 years. Well, of course, and I mean, that's why I said I'm going over good things. The Bears put themselves in a position at the end of the game where you're down six points and you have a minute and a half. If that's Aaron Rodgers... That's an opportunity to win the game. That's Patrick Mahomes. It's an opportunity to win the game. That's any of these top-tier quarterbacks. A minute and a half and you're down six, you need a touchdown drive, you can go win that game. Um, You don't usually put a quarterback in that position in his second game in the NFL. However, we did wind up in that position. Caleb did not come through. And so it's like, you know, that's going to be one of those things, in my opinion, that he's going to have to check off the list at some point. The sooner, the better. I don't expect him to do it. However, at least the team put him in position to win. Now, we kept saying it. This is not about the statistical record this year for us. It's not. At no point did I really expect to win this game last night. I didn't. So I'm not upset by any means that we came away with a loss. What I am upset about is that you got your rookie quarterback sacked seven times. What I am upset about is that you're running Nate Davis out there still. Oh, here's the other positive. You didn't let Vilas Jones Jr. touch the ball. Okay, so maybe you learned a little bit of something, right? Just just a little bit of something. But my goodness. Even with that, though, don't you feel like they probably wanted to give Vilas Jones Jones the ball a little bit? Like, you know they want us, to like, just a little bit. He might just save us if he takes this kick return. And he takes mm-hmm. it back house. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Dude. So he- here's the thing. To all the people out there, and, and we've been very respectful, very mild. We've been the guys to sit here and tell you, hey, we're just two guys with an opinion. We're not pretending we're trying to be smarter than everybody else. We're not pretending we're trying to be smarter than the guys at Hell's Hall. But, man, with just – Two guys with an opinion, it seems so obvious to us where it just it, – it can't – it's not that difficult. It really isn't. I opened up a show a couple weeks ago. First line was, fuck Nate Davis. What do you think was going to happen? You think, think – uh, like I said, if he plays on a, a Pro Bowl level this year, I'll eat my words and I'll give him the benefit of the doubt moving forward, right? But the guy didn't practice. Of course, he's going to run out there and suck. And then you have players like Tevin Jenkins saying, well, at the end of the day, the calls come in and we execute them, and some stuff's just beyond us. To, to build on that real quick, he's the third player in the last day to say the exact same thing. Okay. If you haven't seen that, it's, well, we're running the plays that are called for us. Maybe this is – I feel like they're almost carrying over their frustrations with Luke Getze into <laughs> into this new scheme. But and, there was a lot more leash on Luke Getze from the players even. This is the benefit of having a young team. And you can rah-rah it a little bit. Um, but this is their second co- offensive coach, their second defensive coordinator. This is their – what should have been their second head coach, their – you know, these are not these are guys that are going from young 22 year olds and the majority of your team is 22 and 23 year olds to now it's, you know, Jalen, Jalen uh, Johnson is a, a pro bowler and this and that. You're talking to grown men who are accountable and get called out. And the last thing you want to do is piss them off with no accountability on yourself. And this goes back to Justin Fields. The guy accidentally slipped up and made his head and his offensive coordinator accountable. And he had to retract that statement. So you know, you know, Thai, it just takes you back to Justin Fields' first start where he got sacked nine times. 
This is Caleb Williams' second start. He's getting sacked seven times. I mean, two really bad challenges, not not according to Eberflus. According to Eberflus, I don't know if you guys heard this. I mean, I put together a video on these press conferences. I'll come out with the Eberflus one after the show, and I'll, I'll let you guys hear it for yourself. He said, since I've gotten here, we've been really good at that. You're two for seven. You're 0 and 2 last night. How do you clean that up to make sure that those challenges go in the right direction for you? Yeah, I mean, we've been pretty clean overall, you know, since we've been here. No, you're not really good at challenges. And those are two obvious challenges. Now, the second one, I understand a little bit more, more due, due to the fact that the situation could have turned that game around. But at the same time, it's your second challenge then. You can't sit there and just waste it on something that's obvious just because it's a situation. Like, no, if you had two in your pocket and you wanted to throw one on the Kyler Gordon thing, fine. I get it. But you can't make that your last one. It's gone on different shows, and, and I've heard all these different predictions. 11 wins, 12 wins. And I was just, you know, I bit my lip this time. Last year I was saying, no, you guys are crazy. Because last year some people were even predicting them at 11 wins, and it's just it wasn't happening. This year, I guess, maybe. But a 12-win team's a powerhouse, like a powerhouse. David, we both had them at 9 and 8. At best, 10 and 7. But 9 and 8? I'm now looking at the product on the field, struggling to feel comfortable about predicting nine wins. We're not going to be the guys that are homers. Look, guys, look at our next three opponents. We could easily be four and one. Are you kidding me? You are penciling in victories with this team now? You. When's the last time you've refused won three games in a row? We're going to be four and one all of a sudden? Guys. You like get real. This is not a good football team. It's not a, a well coached football team by any means. We got a number one overall draft pick, and I said it with Justin Fields. I'm gonna say it with Caleb Williams. This looks like the way to destroy a quarterback, not the way to develop a quarterback. And you know, I, I went on different shows, and people were predicting, you know, four thousand five five thousand yards was even thrown out there once at me. I was just like, you've mm. got to be kidding. Well, why? He's generational. Well, if we're if he's the number one overall pick, then we should expect that out of him. No, there's still quarterback development that needs to take place. This kid's a 22-year-old kid. He's a rookie. He's a great prospect. He's a great talent. You can still – man, I wouldn't wish for five athletes like that to jump and beat the shit out of my worst enemy every week. You know what I mean? Like, you're putting this kid in there to go die. <laughs> like, man, I'll tell you, it, I said this to somebody, too. If this goes south, and he's like, go south? Oh, it, it can't go south. No, this is going to work. This is going to work for sure. Nothing's handed to you on a damn silver platter in this league. You got to earn it all. We have mentioned how our our – Concern was with the coaching. I'm no longer concerned. I'm, I'm fucking pissed, man. And listen, there's going to be some wins along the way. I'm going to have to retract that a little bit, just like I had to last year because we put together a good end of the season. And then I'm going to sit there and go, oh, well, you know, I'm going to start making excuses. Oh, well, of course it doesn't make sense to get rid of a guy after just two years. He had a hot end to the year. Does he deserve to get fired? This and that. But the whole time we're sitting there just trying to make excuses. Meanwhile, we had to replace an offensive coordinator. We had to replace a defensive coordinator. I've asked people, who's the worst coaching staff in this division? It's us. It's easily us. And to sit there and have to, like, think about it means you're just trying to fool yourself. <laughs> you're trying to fool yourself. And I wish they would have just pulled the plug all at once, gotten the new quarterback. I know people aren't high on Jim Harbaugh or, or people have mixed feelings. Some people are, some people aren't. Guess what? His team's rushed for 400 yards in two games. Guess, guess what he would have made sure to do? He would have made sure that the, he had an offensive line there to protect Caleb Williams. We talked about – how in the draft, clearly the holes were offensive line, defensive line, specifically center, guard. And we go after a wide receiver three and a punter. And I, I'm not hating on the punter, man. And I'm not trying to hate on Odunze. From a team-building perspective, though, you have holes. You could have dropped back, gotten a defensive lineman, and gotten a center. And then you're not sitting here starting these – this is the worst part. We did it exactly. I'm sorry, David. I'm rambling. I'm going on. And no, yeah, I love it. I, dude, I need dude, to match your energy when you're done. Dude, we did this with Lucas Patrick. We went out and got Luke Getzey, and we went out and got Lucas Patrick. Why? Because he's familiar with the system. It's such placating bullshit. 
We're not going to beat you physically. We're going to beat you with the system, man. Because we're smarter than everybody. That's right. And what do we do this time? We went out. Listen, I thought Coleman Shelton was going to be like the just in case backup. <laughs> and you're starting. And he's getting his fucking ass pounded in oh two my weeks God, out, dude. So um, I'll tell you what. Offensive line problems, not easy to fix. Does Impossible that... to fix Change. midseason. Man, week it's... three, you don't fix those. It's going to be so such a rough season. And I think because, you know, the fan expectation for the wins for a playoff push or something is, is all there. Oh, man, get ready for this roller coaster ride because I have a feeling we're going to be sitting there at the end of the year scratching our heads wondering why did we not even interview Jim Harbaugh I remember I remember vividly being in the car calling you the moment Eberflus got hired my first comment to you was he's a nice guy from a nice team and he coached a bunch of nice players and that means absolutely fucking dick in the NFL I want to be We're honest and talk about this team I brought this up to you week 2 of the preseason yeah. Right. So these are these are concerns that I've been addressing since like week two of the preseason. It's finally it's come to fruition. Starting from Flus, I don't think this guy's a professional NFL head coach by any means, by any stretch of the imagination. Um, he's a nice guy who's nice to his players and he's a player's coach. He there there is next to zero accountability in that. And you can be a nice guy and a nice head coach and be accountable. Lovey Smith did it, Tony Dungy did it. Rod Marinelli did it. These guys are nice people and they're good people. Does not necessarily mean that with the right group of people, they're going to be good head coaches. At the end of the day, accountability in the NFL is everything. Because these are grown fucking men with families and jobs and jobs to do. And at this point, the only thing Eberflus has held accountable is the players and nothing else. He has never held himself accountable. He's never held his offensive coordinators accountable never held his defensive coordinators accountable. It's always just passing the buck and just, you know, hey, these are the, the way the things go. And sometimes you just got to say, you know what, we fucked up and we're going to fix it. And that I think that's where it starts and ends with, with the coaching side of it. I think there's a lot more systematic issues going on with the Chicago Bears. And I, I've told you from the beginning, and you've convinced me otherwise many times, that sometimes ownership doesn't have to change just to change a team. But my belief before that, before you've convinced me, is that it starts from the McCaskies and starts and goes down. There's a weird sense of lack of accountability and lack of ownership and lack ownership in the sense of I own my fuck ups. And that starts from the McCaskies down. And uh, we can continue to go on. I think Shane Waldron's a fucking fraud. I don't think this defense. I think this defense is going to be exhausted and frustrated by week six, week eight. I think you'll see some some stuff from the offense that you might like, but like you said, the 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 key word, and every time you talk about a different subject, and I'm talking about the fans that you're talking about who predict 12 and 13 wins, the coaching staff, the ownership, fucking arrogance. The word is arrogance. The walk around like you've already penciled in 12 fucking wins and you're this charter franchise and you have this accountability the fucking arrogance of these people is making me sick to my stomach because if me and you know anything is we bust each other's balls and we call each other out all the time and when you're wrong you're wrong and when you're right you get to say you're right chase claypool situation all over again like especially when it comes to nate davis specifically in my opinion nate davis the only time I'd let him play another snap in a Bears uniform is literally if he's the last healthy guard I have. I would give just about anybody else a shot there at this point based off what I'm seeing. Got to put this in a perspective. Typically, you get 8 to 10 offensive drives a game. On a second down, to let pressure through and sack your quarterback for 5, 6, 7 yards is a drive killer. It's one play. And, and it just gets shown as this one 10 seconds mess up that you can dissect and maybe explain what he's doing and this and that. You don't understand. That's 10% of your drives shot in the foot. You do that two, three times in the game, you've ruined like a third of 
of the chances single-handedly. That's why these mistakes are critical. And they, the word unacceptable needs to be like double underlined. And then you need to hold the guys accountable for their mistakes. I mean, it is just, uh, it's a nightmare to sit there and just try and kick this dead horse, hoping it's just going to jump back up and start running around everywhere, right? Man, uh, so I, I can't deal with the Nate Davis thing. I really can't. Uh, I don't care who you have in there. You need to figure that out. Another thing is Tevin Jenkins played his worst game of the year last year when he got moved to left guard. Okay? Because you got Nate Davis, and he's a right guard, you've now permanently moved Tevin Jenkins to the left guard, where he hasn't had a good game really yet. If – at all, you knew what you were do. You need at least half that line to be okay. I would definitely have Tevin Jenkins next to Darno Wright. Period. I don't care. Period. Point blank. Dude, like, again, arrogance. Arrogance comes to mind. Like the word arrogance, Paulie, and the arrogance of thinking that you know better. That Tevin Jenkins has moved three positions in four years at this point, and you're just like, yeah, we got this. We know exactly how to use him and where to use him and. Who cares where he can play well? Like, but we know better because we got Nate Davis and Coleman Shelton. And you know what? Ryan Bates. Let's throw Ryan Bates in there. Cause I, I failed on getting him like a year ago. So let's let's spend a pick that's almost the same as getting for Keenan Allen. You spent almost as much draft capital trading for Ryan Bates as you did for Keenan Allen, a bona fide Hall of Famer. This was not a travesty of a result. We said this. The numbers aren't really that interesting. Caleb played a pretty good game. We're one and one. But the eye test is going to tell you much more than you want to predict this year. Realistically, you should be 0-2. And, and there are very few 0-2 teams in this, in this league right now. And most of them are absolute jokes and dumpster fires. You're in the bottom five of teams. You are. You're bottom five to bottom seven. You're in there with Carolina, Atlanta. You're in there with the New York Giants. These really badly organized run franchise. The starting center from Buffalo was released two days after the Bears traded for Ryan Bates. They knew Ryan Poles' obsession with Ryan Bates. They knew he wanted him. They got what they could for him as a fifth. Then they released Pro Bowler Mitch Morris two days later, and Mitch Morris signed as a completely free agent two days later because the Buffalo Bills were in contract hell. Ryan Bates has never, ever played an entire full season. That's great that you have this idea. What do you have to back it? At what point has Ryan Bates shown you anything towards him being the savior? Just got to let him get healthy. It's the same old thing. We just need more time. We just need more time. You just need to let this thing gel. You, We, we just need to consistency and this and that. And it's your tenant. If Ryan five. Bates was the same, he'd 25. be on Buffalo. Your tenant there. If Ryan Bates was this good, he'd still be with Buffalo because he's a $3.8 million contract. You're 10 and 25 as a head coach. When you look through the history of this league, there aren't many coaches that start 10 and 25 that wind up being good coaches. So the idea that this thing's going to magically turn around at some point, one is just historically that doesn't give you any kind of backing to, to think it will. I have been one to not criticize Ryan Poles much, if at all. I've liked Ryan Poles and the moves he's made. And so it's hard for me to sit there and like those moves all along the way and then kind of turn on him. Ultimately, though, I think the one thing that's really going to hurt him is the fact that he just stood there and backed Matt Eberflus with no question during this last offseason. I mean, with no question, as if there aren't better coaches out there. You you had to replace your offensive and defensive coordinator. We, we don't have an identity as, as an offense. In week two, you're sitting there, and I think Ryan Zero. Poles did a good job at getting talent together. You don't have the right guys in place to use that talent in any any correct way. Yeah. No, 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 no. Thigh. We expected the loss. 
That, this that's, is, that's the this thing. is not what this is about. The, the What this is about, and I'm going to speak for myself here, is it is not that you're 0-2 or 1-1 or losing to 0-2. The Ravens are not freaking out. The Bengals are not freaking out. Because there they, are things there that result in wins that are infrastructural, that are a, a basis of – of, of skill of comp of like of competency what we're talking about is you went one and one losing to a super bowl favorite and none of the problems that have come up in the first two weeks are fixable mid-season much less after two games so we're looking forward to 15 games this isn't like you need a, a little bit of pass rush so you go trade for trey hendrickson you need an offensive weapon so you go get a receiver at the trade deadline for a bad team this isn't like Okay, we need like a linebacker because we can't cover the middle. This is you have zero depth at interior yeah. offensive line, and it's been a problem for three fucking years. You have had bad coaching for three fucking years. You've completely ignored it, and it's rearing its ugly head again. We are hoping here a lot. We're hoping this gets better. We're hoping the quarterbacks. It plays better. We're hoping to get some wins. We're hoping these that Shane Waldron's going to somehow be some leader for this team and be this great offensive genius. But a lot of teams have more confidence than just hope. The only thing I'm confident about is I've seen this before. I've seen it multiple times. This is how you ruin a quarterback. That's what I'm confident about. I'm confident that we're in the process right now of at a very, very, very early point in Caleb Williams' career, just straight up stunting him right away. And, man, the best way to do that is to let him go out there and just get his head bashed in. I mean, it is, that's what I'm confident about. Everything else is hope. When you look at the good teams in the league, they're not hoping. The Kansas City Chiefs aren't hoping. They're, they know. They know they're damn good. That's why when they face a team like us, they put they forty five to ten. That's what happens. It's just it's it's this comment, it's this comment that I look at that gets to me. And you you know why it gets to me? Because it actually says everything. A Super Bowl favorite in their stadium is wild. Go back one year. And the Bears and the Texans were right here. Where? How does it get better? That's my question to, is this reaction appropriate? I love that I'm being told I'm overreacting. Because then when I hear 11, 12 wins projected, people don't understand overreacting is not just negative. I look at those people like, you're overreacting. Yeah. <laughs> way too positive. The air, again, back to that word, arrogance. The arrogance to say that you have penciled in 12 wins. Well, that's not good enough. 12 wins in this league? You are a top five team in this league every year. Twelve wins, penciled in. You're a powerhouse. We might that might th there's Michael Parsons wouldn't help this. No, it wouldn't, and that no trade would. Trey Hendrickson doesn't matter. Cam Jordan doesn't matter. Micah Parsons doesn't matter. None of this matters. No team is getting rid of good offensive linemen. My point is, is like, how does this get better? You could have had Connor Williams two weeks ago for money, a former Pro Bowler. In, in Miami. As much criticism as I had on him, oh my God, would this, that be so much better than, than what we have, David? And again, it gives you flexibility. Then I actually would tolerate a conversation with Ryan Ryan Bates being at right guard and Tevin Jenkins at left guard and Nate Davis being the fucking swing guard, whoever gets hurt, whatever. But the arrogance to be like, we don't need Connor Williams. Your fucking starting center was Coleman Shelton and you were like, this is fine. Are we sure that Ryan Poles is that good? And, and and you, how like did I you? Said, I I back off of it because I I like him, but when you lay it out there on paper, I can't disagree with the points you make. Starts at at Ryan Poles holding on to Chase Claypool for way too long, for actually having Bayless Jones Jr. still on this fucking roster, him being employed on a fifty three man roster could have had an extra lineman. Is unacceptable. I asked you, can you name me the top three to four offensive players on the Chicago Bears and the top three defensive players on the Bears as they currently stand? Right on offense, you clearly have it's DJ Moore, it's probably Keenan Allen, it might be DeAndre Swift in terms of like pure skill players. Some might argue Darnell Wright. I disagree. Right, whatever. Oh, come on. 
Cole Komet, right? So skill players on offense, DJ Moore, Keenan Allen, uh, DeAndre Swift, Cole Komet, none of them drafted by Ryan Poles. Uh, the closest thing to it is that Cole Komet got re-signed. DJ Moore was in a trade, Keenan Allen a trade, DeAndre Swift's a re-sign, uh, free agency signing, Cole Komet, uh, a, a holdover from the Ryan Pace era. You talk about the four, three to four best defensive players on this team, and it's not even close. It's Montez Sweat, it's Jalen Johnson, it's TJ Edwards, Tremaine Edmonds, all four <laughs> players not drafted by Ryan Poles. The closest thing is Jalen Johnson. He's a one-year holdover, and he was re-signed by Ryan Poles. Reluctantly, everybody else is a free agent or a trade for. Okay, And I was arguing with Paulie that Mike Parsons might be a pretty good investment in this team. Right, that and Paulie's not in favor of it, and neither am I. I'm not in favor of it. But my argument was that maybe draft picks in Ryan Poles' hands are not the best case scenario because draft picks in Ryan Poles' hands are better used as trade bait. I think that's just what he's represented as a as a general manager. I have the 2022 draft. Okay, and we're gonna go through these players and say what you want about who's how long it takes for players to develop really, really good players take one to two years, really mediocre players take maybe three to really show their stripes. Right. For me, it's positions. I give okay. positions different time, but three okay. years, but fair just enough. about any position three years. Yeah, it's three years. So 2022 is Kyler Gordon, Jaquan Brisker. Okay. Both of those guys, jury's still out. I, I would debate that they're maybe deserving of a second contract on this team, but it's a very, very mid-level contract. They're they're mediocre at best, correct? With still room and time for some improvement. Yes. Not really, because it's 2022, so they need to resign their contracts as of right. next year. Okay. So their right. their contracts I, I expire say, next year. I would year. say I'm more favorable about Kyler Gordon than I am Jaquan Brisker. And I, and I'd that's fucked it. up because I would say the opposite, and neither of us is wrong. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Continue. Valus Jones Jr. Christ. Okay. His best draft pick of that draft, would you care to take a guess? Braxton Jones. I would argue Rashawn his Johnson second. Was part of that? Nope. No, I would no, argue uh, his second best draft pick of that draft, 2022, uh, is Jalen Jones. Yes. And then Jalen Jones in the sixth or seventh. Was round. the defensive end drafted? In that Dominique draft Robinson was yeah. fifth round. Tristan Ebner, uh, Kramer, Doug Kramer, Jatiri Carter, and Trenton Gill. Okay, and then we also made like six waiver wire moves that year. And sure. then we, and then, and then also just like, listen. Now, like I said, this is we're going to go back and forth because if anything, I'm on the one side and you're on the other. Also, we started off, I believe, with six picks and wound up with like ten. Sure. So and those are your ten. Need of overhaul, but sh- but you're right. But what you're saying is correct. And, and I here's where I'm going to backpedal a little bit, and I'll give him credit, and I'm not going to get too shitty about 2022. I went through and looked for picks after our picks. There's really – 2022 was a post-COVID really shitty draft, a lot of shitty players. That's, that's a good point. But just, just a point like to be made, like starting uh, guards like Cam Jurgens after Valus Jones Jr., so you could have had this – Players like Abraham Lucas, starting right tackle of the Seattle Seahawks. Isaiah likely was drafted in the fourth round. Okay. Uh, yeah, there you go. So just just little things. Players of need, but you just chose to ignore them. And here's number 23 draft, okay? And the jury's still out. Darnell Wright, Jervon Dexter, Zach Pickens, Tyreek Stevenson, Roshan Johnson, Tyler Scott, Noah Sewell, Smith, I wrote down, and Travis Bell. Oh, it's Terrell Smith. Terrell Smith. Terrell Smith. Terrell Smith. Yeah, Terrell Smith. Terrell Smith. As of right now, not a terrible draft. Okay. No. But Darnell, still, right, like you said, still, you still need time to pan this one out. A lot of time. Zach Pickens, I think we can agree, is just pretty much a, a, a bust. He's, he's just not He's not relevant. He's not existent. Jervon Dexter's pretty good. Tyreek, through two weeks, has been pretty bad. One of the worst graded PFF corners in the league. Understood. He did. The entire game plan game. against Houston was to pick on Tyreek, and it worked. Okay. Okay. Just I mean, it, throwing it, it out it, there. It, it I don't work. Lo- I love Tyreek. Love him. I like him. I love him. He's not a perfect player by any means. Not He's by still any young. Means. 
However, a four interception rookie season, he, he, there's some upside to Tyreek. Roshan Johnson is got punched in the face. Uh, he got punched in the face. Uh, uh, yeah, sure. Um, Tyler Scott was an active, healthy scratch week one over Valus Jones. Okay. Noah Sewell hasn't been healthy or played a game. Terrell Smith has probably been second best rookie from this class in terms of proving it on the field. And I mean, then Javon Travis- Dexter, Javon Dexter, Darnell Wright, Tyreek Stevenson. I would give them all more of an upside than okay. Terrell Smith. Yeah. Sure. Okay. And then Travis Bell. I wrote down and I started going through the 2023 draft picks that were taken after these guys. And the list is astonishing. It got uh, worse and worse and worse you know, and worse as I went. Real quick, you can do this every year with just about any team, though. Sure. But this is recent and we're in it. So and it's like, yeah. No, you no, no, do- no, no. I got specific. Okay. Let's this is not just, just like a bunch of pro I'm bowlers I just fucking threw out that every team okay. skipped. All right, all right. So I went for positions of need, offensive center, offensive guard, 10 players that are starting linemen in the NFL that you could have had for next to nothing. Joe Tipman drafted, th- uh, drafted 43rd, starting off offensive guard. Matt Bergeron, starting offensive guard, drafted at 38. Keon White, starting uh, center, uh, drafted 39. Cody Motch drafted 47th, starting offensive guard for the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. Uh, we've gone through four starting interior offensive linemen between 38 and 47 at this point. And that is a draft pick that you didn't have, but you probably could have gotten. A pick after, every pick is after Zach Pickens naming these starting centers and starting guards. Exclusively. Only starters. John Michael Schmitz, Juice Juice Scruggs, Tyler Steen, Byron Young was a defensive tackle taken. So I'm swapping those as in as if like you could have drafted a defensive tackle later and taken an offensive guard or center earlier. Anthony Bradford and Dewan Jones in the fifth. I got to the fifth round before I gave up. With starting yeah. offensive linemen taken in last year's draft only. We got to 10. And the arrogance, yet again, I throw that word, arrogance, that you didn't need one of these guys is fucking absurd. Chris Morgan got, not only has he produced absolutely nothing from the offensive line for two fucking years, then he turned into the running game coordinator that took a significant shit this early off, this early season. The running game that was not a problem for two to three years with Justin Fields there has now taken a massive shit since Chris Morgan got promoted to running game coordinator is now, and now you're just giving, you're empowering and not holding accountable shitty people in your building that are bad at their job. And that's kind of what we're, this whole point of this episode is, is just ranting about the lack of accountability and promoting the shitty work ethic and shitty jobs that these people are doing. Here's so, what he said exactly yesterday. He said, stop running outside left. These tackles are laid off the ball with a silent count. And then Kyle Long commented on it. He goes, yeah, pre-snap, they're not even looking at their matchups. Yeah. Dude, these are two guys that were linemen. They're literally telling you what, what the coaching issue here is on the offensive line from their couches just because they know what they're talking about because they're linemen. Uh, so c- clearly something's off here. And, w- and when you go from Sam Mustafer and he leaves and he does fine on the Ravens, Lucas Patrick and he leaves, he was graded, what, the highest center this this week? I yeah. mean, they were train wrecks here. And now you get the next guy in, Coleman Shelton, and he's a train wreck. Clearly there's something going on beyond just the player themselves. Yeah. This isn't working. Dude, and, and so – Finishing my Ryan Poles point, the coup de grace, one of the greatest trades ever made in NFL history and maybe in sports history, is with the worst run franchise in NFL history, is the current Carolina Panthers. Congratulations 
you pulled their pants down and you got a good first round pick. Awesome. You Let's move on. Trade. Let's move on. What else have you done? A little bit. I, I was listening to this one show, this one podcast, and guys going off like, I'm in Chicago for the time being, and it's so toxic. Just listening to the radio, even listening to just ESPN 1000 for an hour a day, and these guys shitting on the team, which, which they're not. They want the best for the team. They're just telling you what they're seeing and what the issues are. They're just laying it out there. No one's shitting on the team. But he's like, it's so toxic. I don't, I don't I, dude, David, me and you live here. I was at the DMV sitting next to a guy. I saw he had a Bears hat on, 30-minute Bears conversation. It's unavoidable, okay? This is, I go to the damn games. Man, this is why we're critical. Because we damn care. It's not pretty. It's not. And so that's how you wind up with a 12 win prediction. Because you don't, you think everything's sunshine and flowers. It's not. There's tons of issues. And in my opinion, a, a, a coaching staff change could really, really impact this thing a lot in a positive way. And I truly think we're just going to look back at this. And think, like, why did we help hold on to Matt Eberflus? And then I think, well, why was Ryan Pohl so adamant about What a wasted year. Up? Yeah, again. Stroud did start 0-2, man. And, but, like, no one knew who Tank Dell was or Nico Collins was. So, I, 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 you can't go into that situation saying that you expected the Texans to be good. Bear, dude, Texans were hoping to not get the next top five pick at the beginning of last year. We're not to have two top five picks in a row. People are people are coming out here predicting 12 win, wins. The arrogance. When we ran through the schedule, the first time I came up with 10 wins, and immediately I was like, no, 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 no. That was too easy. Too easy to count to 10. Let me go back and look at this again because that's not what the NFL is. It's not too easy. It's damn fucking hard. And we've seen this because we've gotten smacked in the jaw two weeks in a row now. Regardless of the record, regardless of the record, I'm telling you, this is – what's the long run here? If we make the playoffs, like, we're getting bounced. Like, if if magically we do it, this is not the guys that are going to take you where you need to go. That's evident. We're going to struggle against every single opponent this year. If, if this continues, because because offensive line issues, this is why teams build a certain way. They build from the inside out, and you hear it over and over and over and over and over and over. The best way to implode an offense, guys, is an offensive line. 